office of President of the United States. For democracy belongs to us all. A government for our tomorrows. Where I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. We gather because we have chosen hope over fear. Because this moment is your moment. It belongs to you. Meet this moment as the United States of America. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Election 2024, the post-political roundtable. I'm Sean Sullivan, the campaign editor here at The Washington Post, and today we continue our discussion of the 2024 election with some of the top political journalists in our newsroom. First up today, Tyler Pager, White House reporter here at The Post. Tyler, welcome back to Election 2024. It's been too long since we've, uh, we've had you on the program. Thanks for having me back, Sean. So Tyler, we got to start with this breaking news um, that surprised me when I took a look at the news alert earlier, which is that Mitch McConnell, the longtime Republican leader, now the minority leader in the Senate, is planning to step down from his leadership position in November. Um, let's start by sort of talking about how this sort of seismic earthquake of a story is, is resonating right now. Yeah, the end of an era, or will be the end of one in November. He's obviously led the party for many years through many different uh, periods of, of American history and of the changing Republican Party. He's had immense power to shape um, government and policy and politics throughout this country, um, from the Supreme Court um, to a range of policy priorities that he has pursued um, as the leader of, of the Republican Party in the Senate. Um, so now him stepping aside opens up uh, a race for uh, the next leader of the Republican Party. And I think this race will tell us a lot about what direction the party is moving into. Mitch McConnell has a very complicated relationship with Donald Trump. He has not spoken to him, reports say, since the January 6th uh, insurrection. Um, that, and now Trump is the, the front runner for the Republican nomination. So it's incredibly unusual for the, the Republican nominee, the former president, to not be speaking to the leader of the party in the Senate. So whether or not the Senate um, conference there adopts uh, a, a leader in more like Donald Trump or in the line of Mitch McConnell will tell us a lot about what that looks like. But I also think Mitch McConnell is reading the tea leaves in that he is no longer um, the base of the Republican Party. He used to have a lot more senators that were like minded, and that is not the case anymore. Um, so just a, a tremendous development today in American politics. Yeah, that's really fascinating, that dynamic that you talk about. I mean, it, it is just extraordinary to think of a high-ranking Republican in the Senate and the leader of the party, essentially, and the presumptive nominee in the eyes of a lot of people not even talking. Tyler, you've covered President Biden as closely as really anybody on the beat. What is What has Biden's relationship been like with McConnell? And could this change anything in terms of actual business that could get done, legislation that could get done the rest of this year? Or is this more of sort of a long-term uh, political question for Republicans on what they want to do? Yeah, I think we've already sort of seen that relationship change. I mean, Joe Biden served in the Senate for 36 years, and many of those years he served alongside Mitch McConnell. They have a, a working relationship. They're not close by any... Mitch McConnell is one that Joe Biden really does know and knows well, and they've managed to figure out uh, a way to get things done. Obviously, the president has had a number of bipartisan accomplishments from infrastructure bill um, to the CHIPS Act to, um, uh, you know, other pieces of, of, of legislation, uh, gun, gun control, um, uh, veterans, of, veterans benefit, expansion of veterans benefits. So there's been a whole thing, uh, a slew of things that the president has needed um, Mitch McConnell to help um, him on because he's needed those votes. So this will obviously transform that dynamic. Um, we've already seen Mitch McConnell uh, step away from, for example, the, the bipartisan border bill after uh, Trump said that he was against it. The big question is whether or not they can get this Ukraine funding uh, across the finish line. The president met with the big four congressional leaders yesterday, and three out of the four, the exception being Speaker Johnson, are supportive of this foreign aid package. Biden really wants to get this done, and it's going to be incumbent on him 
to work with McConnell uh, in the Senate and obviously Republicans in the House to do so. Um, but but it really is the end of this era where two longtime senators, Mitch McConnell obviously still being in the Senate, worked very closely with President Biden. Yeah, a lot to watch and unpack with McConnell uh, in the next few weeks and months ahead. Um, OK, Tyler, speaking of President Biden, there was a primary last night uh, that we saw results for in Michigan. Uh, the president did win, but he did also face a pretty notable challenge, not from an actual candidate or challenger, but from uh, uncommitted, which was effectively a protest vote against him. Can you talk a little bit about this sort of unusual situation, what this means and, and how we should sort of interpret this um, as a measure of President Biden's standing in his own party? Yeah, really a remarkable moment last night when more than 100,000 people voted in the Democratic Party for this uncommitted option. Obviously, it doesn't really impact President Biden's uh, move toward the nomination. Uh, he is going to be the nominee. But what it does say is that there are some warning signs for Democrats for the president in November. Michigan, a must-win state. Trump only won it by a few um, thousand votes in uh, 2016 against Hillary Clinton. Biden won it by a much more comfortable margin, roughly 150,000 votes in 2020. But this is a state he has to win. And there are big issues for him in this state with two very sizable voting populations. And that was further confirmed last night, that being Arab Americans, Muslim Americans, and college students, young, young, young voters. Um, obviously, a lot of this uh, protest and this disappointment with Biden stems from his handling of the, the war in Gaza and his uh, unequivocal support for uh, Israel and what uh, activists say is not enough compassion and sympathy for the plight of, of people living in Gaza and the fact that he is not called for a ceasefire there. So uh, when you talk to the Biden campaign, uh, they will tell you, uh, you know, Biden still won by a very sizable margin. Um, the, the overall percentage is similar to what Obama had uncommitted in 2012 when he was running for re-election. But at the end of the day, there were still more than 100,000 people who decided to turn out and vote for uncommitted. And that raw number suggests that the Biden campaign and the president himself have their work cut out for them over the next few months to try to win back some of those people. Um, many of them will likely vote for Biden, but the margins are so tight that they can't lose uh, that many uh, either not voting or deciding to vote for Trump uh, in the fall. Yeah, I have a feeling we're going to be spending a lot of time in uh, Michigan. Tyler, over the next um, few months. Uh, but tomorrow, at least, uh, President Biden and his likely Republican opponent, Donald Trump, are expected to make these sort of dueling appearances down at the southern border. Um, what, what do you make of this uh, sort of uh, you know, split screen between these two rivals and what will you be watching for? Yeah, this is uh, another split screen that we're seeing as we move into the general election. Obviously, uh, a few weeks ago, both Biden and Trump went to, as we were talking about Michigan, um, as there was, uh, you know, uh, on, on the issue of organized labor. But this is a really remarkable moment. They will both be at the border tomorrow. This comes as Biden has been trying to pass this bipartisan border bill and Trump has been uh, advocating against it and effectively killing its chances in the Congress by telling Republicans not to support it, uh, all but dashing its hopes of, of moving forward. Uh, tomorrow, I'll, I'll be looking for a few things. What does the president do? What is his message uh, about immigration? It's an issue that is vexing the country. Uh, recent polling shows it is now climbing up in terms of voters' concerns as they head uh, it, into the, the heat of the general election this summer and into the fall. So it's clear that Biden recognizes it's a problem. He tried to fix it uh, or tried to address it somewhat with this legislation. So with that legislation being killed by Trump, what is the next step? What is the message? And then for Trump, I think we largely know what to expect. A lot of the same rhetoric blaming Biden for um, the, the problems that we're seeing across the country as it relates to immigration. Um, and so just the, the fact that they'll both be there highlights how important this issue is for them and for voters in November, but how they talk about it, I think, and what they try to propose. I don't think we're expecting a lot of policy solutions or suggestions from Trump, but how Biden navigates this, I think, will be quite interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. In my 
previous life, as you know, Tyler, as a White House reporter, I would just remember like the discomfort that a lot of White House officials and Biden himself would show often when asked about immigration, when asked about the border, just wasn't something that they wanted to emphasize. It looks like they're sort of trying to take a new tack now, but we'll, we'll see how it shakes out. Um, and then next week, the president is going to deliver his State of the Union address. Can you talk a little bit about how big a political opportunity this is for Biden, or, or maybe it's not? You know, how many people are going to be tuning into something like this, and, and how much opportunity is there for him to sort of send a message and set the table for this election year? Yeah, it's a great question, Sean. And it's something the White House and the president and his campaign are planning a lot of activity around. They see this as a huge moment uh, to reset, to slay out the agenda that the president has for not only this year, but also for his campaign and for and should he be elected his second term. They're putting a lot of emphasis on it. They hope a lot of Americans will tune in. I think it remains to be seen how many Americans are going to sit down on Thursday night to watch the president deliver a lengthy speech to Congress. But I think bigger than that, it is a messaging opportunity for them. It's a, it's, it's a chance for the president to speak to the American people and lay out his vision for the country and for the election. And then the campaign will use that uh, to shape their messaging moving forward. So I think it'll tell us a lot about where the president sees his campaign going and how he's setting up the next phase of the year. I think really heading into the conventions this summer, which I imagine is the next time most Americans will sit down to tune in to a big political event. Yeah, lots to watch and unpack uh, at the White House and from President Biden um, over the next week or so. Uh, Tyler Pager, we're going to have to leave it right there, but thank you so much, and don't be a stranger. We'll want to have you back in the program pretty soon. Thanks so much, John. Okay, I want to continue the program now with two more of our top political journalists, Meryl Cornfield and Michael Scherer, uh, both covering the 2024 campaign for us. Welcome back to the program to both of you. Thanks for having Thanks, me. Thanks, Sean. Okay, Meryl, I want to start with you. You had this really fascinating story uh, with your colleagues yesterday about the economy and uh, the role that immigration is playing in some of the economic gains that we're seeing. Can you unpack sort of what you found in, in your reporting and, and in the process of doing the story? Yep. So we went to uh, various places around the country to better understand what the economy is looking like on the ground. And what we found is that immig immigration has contributed to a lot of growth. Uh, recently, we see the economy improving and um, economists point to foreign born workers as a contributing factor for that. So um, in the past year, we've seen 50% growth in the labor market because of foreign born workers and talking with economists and um, industry leaders, you know, especially in places where there had been gaps lingering since the pandemic, we see this workforce now filling those gaps um, and helping the economy improve. And uh, we especially saw this in places where um, immigrant workers have contributed um, in, in construction, agriculture, um, and manufacturing. So Meryl, how do you think the economy factors into this election? I mean, as you pointed out with your colleagues in the story, there are some real economic gains that the country is experiencing right now, but we continue to see these polls that keep showing that voters are showing a huge amount of distrust and a lack of confidence in Biden and his stewardship of the economy. How do we square those two things and, and how does this sort of shape this race ahead toward November? I think one of the examples that we found in the story really captures this. I went to this primarily red district and talked with a business owner who is employing people who are um, immigrants. And he said that um, he pays them a meager wage of $11 an hour when the average in the area is 15. And um, he knows that they can take the work um, and others won't because of how low the pay is. Um, and he said if if he had to pay the $15, he wouldn't be able to compete. So this is an area where these foreign born workers are filling a gap. But um, at the same time, and he's a Democrat, he said this border situation is untenable. It's immoral how these um, immigrants are treated um, and that there's something that needs to be done. And he blames Biden for not doing something about it. Um, he said it's not the fault of these immigrants for coming to seek work in better conditions. It's the fault of the government.
for not helping. And I think what we hear again and again from voters is that this dissatisfaction with how the problem has been handled, it's a difficult one to solve. And it's one that Biden, um, you know, has to has to campaign um, amid, um, you know, as we see, see he's going to the border. Um, and it's, it's something that, um, you know, every, everyone is trying to um, wrap their head around and figure out what the solution would be. Yeah, a lot to unpack there. Um, okay, speaking of finances, Michael, you had this great story last week that looked at campaign finance and looked at the fundraising gap that we are seeing right now between the Biden campaign and its allies and the Trump campaign and, and its allies. What did you find in, in the process of reporting that story? Well, this is a continuation of, a, of, a, of a, uh, an unequal situation that we've had for a number of cycles now. Basically, since 2016, Democrats have been doing much better in fundraising overall. And, and that, that gulf has sort of started to grow, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, Trump sucked up a lot of energy for a long time, pulled energy away from other uh, Republican candidates. Uh, and two, the demographics of the parties have shifted. And, uh, you know, you talk to Republican consultants who do small dollar fundraising, and they'll, they'll say that inflation really hurt their numbers because their donors are working class people. If they have less money at the end of the month, they can't spend that $10, $15. Democratic donors tend to be college educated people. They have a little more disposable income. Why that matters now is that Trump is you know, entering the uh, general election quite a bit behind where Biden is, both in terms of money he has, because Trump's been spending on um, primaries, and in terms of party money. In, in a presidential race, basically the, the, the campaigns themselves can raise $3,300 uh, from an individual donor, but the parties can raise another eight nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000 from that same donor. So and, and the money basically commingles in terms of uh, how you spend it on the election. Um, and, and because uh, the Democratic Party has been gearing up for this for a long time, because Biden's been the presumptive nominee inside the party for a long time, he just is way ahead uh, at the moment. What that's meant is that, that uh, Trump is, is really hitting the road. He's putting a lot more energy into fundraising than he has in the past. He's setting hours aside every week for call time, which is something he didn't like to do as president, didn't do in 2016, um, to, to sort of show a personal touch, writing a lot more personal notes. It's a more traditional donor operation than we've seen from the former president in a while. Interesting. And Michael, what about Trump's legal bills and how does this sort of factor into this equation and this picture we've seen? I guess from previous reports, the extent to which he's spending from some, or at least some of his vehicles uh, toward legal bills or some allied vehicles, I should say. Um, but how does that factor into the overall money chase and to the you know, way donors are considering whether to give to him or his allied super PACs and PACs and, and other groups? Yeah, it's tens of millions of dollars. And it's, this is going back uh, years. I mean, before the current presidential race started, the RNC was paying some of his bills. After the presidential race started, the RNC stopped paying, and his own uh, leadership PAC and another PAC that, that he raises money for began spending money. Uh, uh, there, there was even a transfer back from a super PAC that he had funded to, to spend money uh, uh, on his lawyers. And now there's a debate. He's about to take over the RNC. Uh, he's going to put in place his chosen leadership, and there, it's unclear right now how much the RNC is going to use its money. Again, it's a larger pool of money to pay for his own legal expenses. I think a lot of people in Trump world, I think the former president himself, believes this is political spending. This is in the party's interest to spend money on. I, I'm not sure everybody in the party believes that. The extent to which big donors are concerned is unclear. I think it's a pretty individual um, issue. I think a lot of the smaller donors don't mind. And, and a lot of the bigger donors are going to have their own vehicles uh, to spend to help him, in which they can sort of segregate and prevent uh, their money from going to pay for you know, in one of his many court cases. That's a fascinating dynamic to watch um, in the months ahead. So Merrill, as Trump faces uh, the legal problems that he's facing, you know, 91 criminal charges across four indictments, he's in a race right now against Biden, at least if you look at some of these recent polls, in a, in a pretty competitive spot. I think he's winning. I think there was a recent poll that had him up six. I know there's also been some polls that, that show Biden ahead. But you spent a lot of time talking to voters out in the country. How do you sort of uh, explain where we are in this race right now? What is it about 
the former president that draws voters to them. And on the flip side, for for Biden supporters, you know, why are they why are they with the with the current president right now? What you hear from a lot of people at Trump rallies is they don't view the legal problems as any impediment to voting for him. In fact, I ask, would you vote for him if he's convicted? And they still say yes. Um, I think that um, you can even see how the Trump campaign views this because they um, use these court appearances as a campaign stop opportunity. He stops and talks with reporters and shares the same message about how he views himself as a martyr. Um, and that's something that I think that his base has found appealing in terms of um, feeling like they themselves have been victims of um, being canceled or what have you. And that, that um, you know, that Trump portrays that. Um, it remains to be seen as we get deeper into the court cases, what comes from that. I think that some Democrats hope that when um, the facts are presented in a trial and Americans are paying attention, that they're going to be astounded by Trump's actions and uh, turn around. But um, so far, what we see from um, voters and especially these Republican primaries where Trump is doing very well is um, that, you know, this isn't be stopping him. Yeah, that's really interesting. OK, we've talked about Trump. We've talked about Biden. I want to talk about something that the two of you have been really on top of in your reporting over the last several months, and that is the prospect of a third party candidate in this race and how much impact that could have. Um, Meryl, uh, what is the sort of state of play right now when it comes to the potential for a third party candidate? Is this something that, number one, a lot of voters are, or enough voters, I should say, are talking about wanting um, to, to make a difference at the polls? And in terms of the actual candidates running, are there people out there uh, who are in the mix and looking to get on ballots in a way that could have an impact in November? Yeah, so so far in these early states, when I go and talk with voters, they don't seem that excited to vote for either Trump and Biden, and that reflects in polling. So um, these third party candidates see that as an opportunity. I was at the California Libertarian Convention this weekend, and um, you know what you what you lack in excitement, the rest of the trail. There was definitely some eagerness there, um, where they see the um, this this election and this year as their opportunity. Um, they they talked about you know th these are two unpopular candidates with um, that the that the with flaws that the um, voters are wary of, and this is their time to step in and offer an alternative. Um, how voters react to that um, remains to be seen. We haven't seen anyone vote on a third party candidate yet, so. Uh, we don't know how that will actually reflect in a general election, um, but it's definitely a message you hear from third party candidates so far. Um, there's RFK Jr., um, who is an independent after leaving the Democratic Party, and he has said that he wants to offer an alternative to these two kind of flawed candidates he sees in Biden and Trump after formerly being a Biden ally. He says the He's he's too too old and he hasn't done enough on um, you know the the issues that Ke uh, Kennedy cares about specifically COVID mandates um, so that that's something that we're hearing from candidates um, for these parties but uh, it it's um, something to be seen from voters. Okay, we have a viewer question on this very topic. Uh, Jeff Lucas from California asks, could Nikki Haley take her support? to create a third party. Uh, Michael, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes, there are some double jeopardy laws that are a little would complicate that a little bit, could cause some uh, legal fights. Basically, if you run in a primary for one party, you can't run a general election for another party. But the no labels ticket, which is on ballots in uh, uh, you know 16 or 17 states and has a route to get on ballots everywhere, uh, I think we'd love to have her as a candidate if she wanted to. Uh, I don't think she would switch uh, to do either that or an independent because it looks like what she's doing is setting herself up uh, for another presidential run as a Republican. There, there used to be quite a tradition in the Republican Party that the runner up in the previous election ends up becoming the nominee in the subsequent election. And I, I think she's basically playing her cards right now to be able to say if Trump uh, loses the general election. I told you so. I was the alternative. I am the alternative now. 
let's move the party forward. Um, but it, but it's certainly a possibility. I mean, Chris Christie's been mentioned as someone who could go over to No Labels as well. They, they're going to be meeting next week actually uh, to decide whether to keep moving forward with their process. They really do have a candidate issue. Uh, most of the major people who would be good candidates for them have not come forward. The polling without name brand candidates uh, doesn't show a clear path to them winning the Electoral College. So it's not clear what's going to happen with that. Um, and then you have, uh, like Merrill said, you know, Kennedy, Cornell West, who's seeking ballot access, Jill Stein running in the Green Party. I mean, if you look at a state like Minnesota uh, in 2016, more than 8% of the vote in that state went to third party candidates. That includes Constitution Party, Libertarian Party. There's some places in this country that really have an appetite and arguably would have even more of an appetite this year because so many people are unhappy with the major party nominees or the likely major party nominees. So I, I think it's very possible that that these campaigns, these candidates um, play a significant role in the outcome here. It's not clear that any of them have a path to actually winning any state or any electoral college votes, but they can certainly influence the outcome of, of, of a two-party race. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I wanted to follow up on that, Michael. I mean, you've done a lot of reporting in this space. So how do both sides in the major party sphere see this? How does the Biden campaign think about the threat of a third party candidacy and how does the Trump campaign think about it? Are there are there ways that they are trying on either or both sides to try to maneuver for an advantage? Is this something that worries them? How are they sort of seeing this uh, fascinating prospect play out on both sides? It's definitely an issue of alarm on the Democratic side. The Democratic National Committee has recently hired a bunch of people to sort of focus on third parties. They've been hitting RFK, uh, filing legal complaints uh, with the FEC about how a super PAC is helping him get signatures to get on ballots. Um, there's outside groups on the Democratic side that have really focused on the third party threat to Biden's uh, uh, election in November. Um, and, and they've been coordinating with each other. A lot of that is focused on no labels so far, but I, I think there's signs that that's branching out to focus on Cornell West and RFK. Particularly with those two, the concern is among African-American voters, historically nine out of 10 African American voters who vote vote Democrat, but there have been some polls that show Cornell West and RFK each polling at 13 uh, percent among Black voters. So um, that could be disastrous for Democrats if those numbers held up. A lot of reason to think they won't hold up, but but I think Democrats think they have to do some work there. Um, on on the Trump side, I think they're still taking a wait and see approach. Uh, th there have been some clear shots taken at RFK because he does pull from Trump as well. Um, and I think as polling develops, you could see that becoming far more aggressive uh, down the stretch. RFK does take shots at both Biden and Trump in equal measure. He is a vaccine skeptic, uh, draws a lot uh, from uh, voters who might otherwise vote for Trump. Uh, so he, he could be problematic on that side. I don't think um, the Trump campaign is really worried about Cornell West or Jill Stein. And and at the moment, the libertarians, if they're not going to go with RFK, which it doesn't look like they're going to go, don't present much of a threat uh, either to Trump. I, I think the betting money right now, and it's too early to tell, but the betting money right now is you need the anti-Trump vote to come together. Uh, and, and, and that has to happen for Biden to get reelected. So it's probably uh, all in a greater problem for Biden than it will be for Trump. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I do get the sense that the Democrats are, are worried and you start to see more press releases and more statements and more stuff coming from Biden allies, which is obviously a, a, the, one of the surest signs that uh, that worry is, is cropping up. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left. I wanted to turn to a different topic, uh, Merrill, which is the prospect of a government shutdown, which it feels like we talk about somehow every six months uh, around here. Uh, President Biden was meeting with congressional leaders. Uh, to talk about Ukraine funding, but also ostensibly to head off the prospect of a shutdown. Um, did that yield any progress or are we sort of still on the brink here as we often are of, of, of a potential shutdown? There was some hopefulness that came out of that meeting with Biden, Speaker Johnson specifically. Um, you know, he said that it was uh, he was, quote, very optimistic out, coming out of that meeting. But um, Marianne Sotomayor um, from our Congress team has reported about Johnson's struggles with um, trying to 
find votes. He very much needs to appeal to his conference and rally them. And right now they're divided um, and they need to find some sort of clear path where they can get enough votes in both houses for uh, foreign aid and um, border security package. And there's just has not been any concrete path laid out. Um, and you know the deadline is looming on Friday. So uh, there's a question of uh, whether or not they'll be able to make it in time. Yeah, a lot to watch on that front as well. Uh, OK, uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, so we're going to have to leave it there. But Merrill Cornfield, Michael Scherer, thank you so much for joining us in the program. Don't be a stranger. Please come back on. Love to continue this discussion on uh, third party candidates and, and other fronts in the months ahead. Thank Pleasure. you, Sean. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, for more of these important conversations, sign up for a Washington Post subscription. You can get a free trial by visiting wapo.st backslash live. I wanted to make sure I got that right. Um, thank you all again for joining us. I'm Sean Sullivan, and we will see you next time.